One of the questions I asked Rich Stolley, because, you know, Rich has been in the business so yep. long yep. And, and so many years now, I said, you know, were you, were you always Superman? <laughs> were you always, or was there a time when you, you, you made mistakes um, in the business where, you, where the, the armor wasn't so thick? Are there any times when you, when you look back and, and said you made major mistakes in the, in the business? And what, if so, what would they be? You know, I've had a lot of challenges throughout my career, starting at age 21, and I always had great uplines and leaders and mentors, but they were all uh, on the East Coast. So I'm from California, and all my mentors and uplines were on the East Coast, thousands of miles away from me. So I had a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, um, you know, but... I wouldn't take any of them back because I learned a lot from them. I really did, you know, but just by like making sure I have a great staff, making sure I'm in the right market, making sure my securities license, you know, were, uh, were paid up to date and just little things like that. You know, just, uh, I was so focused on the big goal. Sometimes I forgot about the details and, uh, that's why I'm very excited that my wife has now taken over that role of the operations and, uh, and things got tightened up a lot, which is great. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that, you know, and we've talked, you and I talked about this offline and, and for the book, that, you know, I, I, in the book I say you're one of the most controversial <clears throat> leaders, you're kind of an anomaly, mm -hmm. and I've got my own uh, opinion about, and then I say it in the book, why, why you might be um, one, certainly one of the most controversial leaders. Why do you think that is really? I mean, what, what, is, what is it exactly? Because I know you've got some strong opinions about that, and I do as well, but what, what do you... What do you think the reason is? You know, I think part of it is um, I was successful very young in this business, and I have huge goals, and I have huge dreams, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about it. You know, so our team is very, uh, you know, we have this culture. It's a winning culture, a winning tradition, and, uh, you know, it's kind of people feel like it's us against everybody, but it's not true. I mean, I love everybody in WFG. They're all brothers and sisters, but our team has made a name for itself. We've made a name for ourselves very young, and we got a lot of young people who are good speakers, and they're charismatic, and they're confident, and, you know, some people get a little uh, turned off by that, you know, so, um, so I just think um, some people are jealous, obviously. It happens, and some people don't really know me. A lot of people that talk about me, they've never even had a conversation with me. So I would say, uh, are you talking about the Eric Olson uh, that you've heard of, or are you talking about the Eric Olson that you know? Because there's a, two different people. You know, and that, that's what I would say. Yeah, I, th I think you, you, you make a lot of sense of that because in our business, the speaking business, Tony Robbins is, is really criticized a lot. And yeah. every time I've asked people about it, I say, well, how long have you known Tony yeah. Robbins? They always say, oh, I've never even met him. Yeah, right, <laughs> but right. there's a lot of jealousy because he yeah. was very successful as you were very yeah. young. Yep. And he's bold. Mm -hmm. He's, he's mm -hmm. a big personality. He's a big guy like you are, a mm -hmm. big, bold personality. Mm -hmm. And, and there, is some, there is something, yeah. no question yeah. about it. Let me ask you this, and, and just sort of along those lines, but, but also about your team. <clears throat> Do you believe that, that, that Pinnacle Leadership, your team, is it, is, it, is it a cult of personality? In other words, is it, is it most people just following Eric Olson, or are they following a system more? And I'll tell you why I asked the question, because Swan Wynn, in the interview with Swan Wynn, Swan said that one of the things he thought, I said, how did you become, you know, the biggest of all time in this company? Mm -hmm. And he said, I realized that it couldn't be them following me. They had to follow a system. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on it? Is it as a cult of personality, Eric Olson, or is it more of a system? What, what's your take on your team? Yeah, I mean, our, our thing is be independent, but be in alignment. So everyone's in alignment with the pinnacle way. However, everyone's doing their own thing. So what I do is I... Mm -hmm you know, recruit them and train them and help them and coach them and mentor them and build them up, develop them, and then expect them to run their own show, right? And then they still, you know, counsel with me, let's say once a quarter, but they're running their own show. So I think because my focus is building and developing leaders and I allow them to be independent, however, they're still in alignment, I think that works. Um, so they're definitely not just following me. Um, they're following the pinnacle way, and the pinnacle way is uh, is a winning tradition, you know. And so that's what I would say. Did did you have to f purposely make sure that it did not become a cult of personality, that it did not become all centered around you, because you are so bold and so, you know, straightforward and you know all those things and mentally tough and all that, because it co obviously could yeah, have become. Right, did you have to, right. to push that out? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, personality is not duplicatable. I always say, don't look at my personality, you know, copy my mindset, you know, and if people copy my mindset mentality as a leader, they could become great leaders as well. You know? So if Eric Olson, by some case, drops off the face of the earth, what happens to, to Pinnacle? 
You know, that's a great question. I think uh, I've built enough great leaders that they would still run with it. I really do. I, I believe in my leader's ability and, uh, and what they've done. So I, I know that they'd still run with it. Um, however, uh, I want to build, my goal is to build a thousand, mil, a thousand millionaires who are master builders. And master builders are 100 recruits and 100 sales a month and, uh, in every big city and every big state. So we need a thousand of those. So that's, I'm not stopping until we get that. You know, that's, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Some people have said to me, some of the other leaders and some of the people in the business over the years have said when I've talked about you, um, they'll say, well, you know, I don't know what his motivation is because he's making a lot of money. You just got your $5 million ring, right? Yes. Same as you were making at the toll booth, I'm sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot different. <laughs> exactly, lot right? Different. Yeah, that's no question about that. <clears throat> they say, you know, I don't know, he's, he seems more driven now. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the way I put it in the, in the book was uh, unbridled ambition mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a positive mm -hmm. sense, but mm -hmm. certainly... You know, you're one of the most ambitious people I've inter ever interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of yeah. ambitious people. Um, what's the motivation now? I mean, you're making a bunch of money. You bought all the stuff you can buy. Um, you know, maybe the island. You're going to buy an island maybe. Yeah. But other than that, what's, what's dr what keeps you going at the pace you go? You know, part of it is I sell a big dream and I want to deliver on that dream. Uh, part of it is I'm still young and my team is still young. All of our leaders are just getting seasoned right now. Like I got a lot of, got a lot of guys who are 28, 29, 20, 30 years old and they're just getting good, but they've been in this business a decade. So I look at the best of the best of the best that have ever done this business, like the A.L. Williams, who I, I really respect, and I say, you know what? If they can do what they did, I think we can do it even better. And and, uh, and that's our goal, and that's the vision that I'm putting out for my team. We're going we're gonna to do 250,000 licensed agents, and we're going to develop 1,000 millionaires uh, through our organization. And our team is bought into the vision, and, uh, and they're behind it, and they're ready to go. So it's exciting. What would you say to people that, and, I, and I, you know, as you know, I've interviewed a lot of self-made millionaires for 30 years and all that, um, and, and they're not, they have no problem saying, I did what I did because... I wanted to be rich. Yeah. And you have no problem saying that. And I never had any problem saying that either. But boy, that doesn't go over too well, as you know, when you say it to people, the average person doesn't like it. What do you say to your critics that say, well, and this may be even internally in WFG, that say, well, Eric Olson's a, you know, he's a very talented guy and he's very driven, but he's just in it, he just wants to be hog nasty richer than he already hog nasty rich is. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to those people that you're only in it for the money? Yeah. Well, obviously that's not true. I don't think any, it's true either because I've been around yeah, you. Yeah, anybody that knows me, they know that's not true. I'm not doing it for money. Um, so the bottom line, I already have the money. I've had it for a long time. What I, what I always tell people is I say, hurry up and become successful so then the rest of your career you can go help other people become successful. And that's what it's all about. I get more uh, excitement out of helping other people win than I do even myself winning. And back to the other point, what drives me is uh, I had two upline leaders who I was friends with uh, both quit on me in the business and they both quit the business and when they quit I just felt man they didn't believe in me they didn't believe in what I was doing and I never wanted my team to have that feeling about me because when I'm in there I would say hey we're in the trenches together we're gonna do this another 30 years together you know let's go make it happen I'm not gonna quit on you you're not gonna quit on me and I just remember that feeling when these two upline leader guys quit on me, never even told me, just left in the middle of the night. Jeez. And I said, I never want my team to have that feeling. You know? And so that's, that's one of the things that really drives me. So you feel like you'd be abandoning them in some way Correct. if you slowed down and started drinking uh, margaritas out of a coconut, right? right kind of a thing right. on the beach. You know? Yeah. And I've seen other leaders do that, you know, right when they hit a, right. Mil right when they hit a million dollars a year, they stop, they shut it down. And for me, you know, it was never just about me. It was always about my team winning. And that's why I'm still doing it. Well, that was one of the things that Juan Jaime shared with me in the interview with him. He said, I think he said when he hit $100,000, his wife was making seventy five. I think, if right. I get it right. And he said, well, we never made that kind of money. We're making it. We just kind of – a lot of the leaders said that, that I interviewed. They said whatever level they hit, they just all of a sudden they got comfortable. Right. Is that a real problem for you as a leader when people get comfortable because they've never made that kind of money before? Yeah, part of it is, has to do with your identity. You know, we've recruited a lot of people that were – when they started, they were making twenty, thirty, forty thousand a year, and now they're making three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand a year. And uh, to go from a thirty thousand a year identity 
to a $900,000 a year identity, it's a big jump. Sure. Because now they're wealthier than anybody in their family. Right. Uh, however, um, you know, you got to keep raising your identity. You got to keep raising your associations. You got to keep stretching your own vision. You got to keep writing down new goals so you can get even farther and farther and farther. You know, and that's something that I love to do is write down new goals and keep stretching myself to see what's possible. How do you shake them out of that? Whatever level it is, it's 100,000 or 900,000. Is there a technique you have as a leader that shakes them loose of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I tell them they need to go test drive their dreams, right? Whatever they're doing right now is probably pretty good, but the enemy of great is good. Mm -hmm. And I give them their props and I say, hey, you're doing good. I'm very proud of you. But guess what? You can always do better. There's always another level. And, uh, you know, a lot of people they judge themselves by who they used to be. You know, but, you know, before I was a mechanic and now I'm making 600,000 a year, well, that's impressive. However, you're not that mechanic anymore. You're not that guy. You're the new and improved, successful leader. So you need to compare yourself against your best. Don't compare yourself against the rest or don't compare yourself even to your former self because you're not that person anymore. So I tell them they need to increase their associations. They need to test drive their dreams. They need to keep personally developing themselves every single day. They need to keep writing down their goals and to keep striving for bigger and better. You know, and um, so those are some of the things I, I let them know they have to do. And uh, obviously having a mentor that's, that's more successful, that'll help you uh, help challenge them to reach, reach for more as well. But yeah, that's a, it's a real thing. People get comfortable and, uh, and then they stop doing what they're supposed to be doing. So is there happens. one, is there one thing that shakes them loose air better than anything else? Yeah. Um, getting them around people that are doing a little bit better than them, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, uh, Hey, you know, how much you make? Oh, I make 800. <laughs> what, what do you make? Oh, I make 2 million. Really? Is that guy three, four times better than you? I don't think so. Right. Well then, well, what's the deal? What's the difference? So yeah, that kind of shakes them up, stirring the competition of, of people that are doing better, uh, than them. You know, that's, that's, that's a good one, you know, really, to, really, really helps. So. Can you teach mm -hmm. ambition? You know, I don't think you can teach ambition, but you can really ask some inspired questions to people, you know, about like uh, things like I like to ask things like, um, you know, are you financially where you thought you'd be by now? You know, and if the answer is yes or no, well, why? You know, why, why do you think you're not where you where you thought you'd be by now? You know, and what you make right now, is that your dream income? No, you know, no. Okay. Well, um, you know, are you living in your dream house? Are you driving your dream car? Are you debt free? No, no, no. Well, why not? Well, what's holding you back? You know, how can we help you become the best version of yourself? So I think just being very self-aware and being brutally honest with yourself. Every successful person is brutally honest with themselves. So I think if you ask some inspired questions to make people think, um, I think that'll help shake them up a little bit. You know, we always call it disturb and entice. If people are not disturbed, they're not going to change, you know, so asking really good questions, but coming from a good place, I think will shake people up a little bit. You're good at that, Steve, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You know? Can you can you take a person that you see, maybe they come into your office, maybe one of your people's brought them in or you brought them in. Can you tell? When someone's going to be big, when they're going to be successful, can you can you tell when you meet them? You know, not a hundred percent, but I, I've gotten good uh, at kind of knowing who to work with and and who not to. You know what I mean? Um, we we with quantity comes quality. Uh, but some people say you know that I have the Midas touch, and I don't think that's true. But I do identify people and then separate them from the crowd. You know, I separate them from the crowd and let them know they're not like everybody else. And I really think they can do something big. And then I'll pour belief into them and uh, really build a good friendship with them. And so there is a strategy to build people, absolutely. But I look for their commitment first. And if I see their commitment, I see their will to win, then I'll, uh, I'll separate them from the crowd and, and I'll build them up. And uh, I've gotten good at that. What do you see in, in those people that others might not see? What, what are you looking for? What do you, what do you perceive that shows you that this is someone I need to spend time with? I think the number one characteristic 
of a successful person besides mental toughness is confidence. You know, so if you see some confidence in them, I, I always think, do I see this person on stage speaking in front of a thousand people, commanding a crowd? You know, do I see that? You know, so I look at presence, um, you know, I look at confidence, I look at the commitment level, uh, I look at is the spouse involved? You know, um, you know is the spouse gonna be supportive? You know, things like that. Um, you know, I look at their desire, I look at their track record of if they've ever been successful before in something else, you know, because a lot of times if you've been successful in something else, you can bring that here and be successful here. So those are some of the things I, I look at. But if, if I think they have a good stage presence about themselves and they're committed and they're hungry and they have desire and they're willing to win and willing to be coachable, I'll take that person and bring them up the flagpole with me. Absolutely. Can the average person make it in this? They really can. Yeah, I mean, they can start out average, but they got to know that what got them here won't get them there because, um, you know, as you grow personally, your income is going to grow. So an average person can make it, absolutely, but they got to commit to not staying average. You know, what's the only difference between ordinary and extraordinary is just a little extra. So if they're committed to the, the, the little extra, and, you know, what I tell all my team is one hour per day of personal development, one hour per day of reading books and listening to audios. So if they're committed to stuff like that, then absolutely an average person could make it. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who's watching this right now and they say, well, yeah, that's, that's easy for this guy because, you know, he's making a boatload of money, he's driving a Rolls Royce, he's living the big life. Um, you know, I'm just an average person working an average job. And, yeah, it's easy for him to say he can make it. But, and, they're, and they're in the business, let's say. I like, I like my Bentley Mosain better than that. <laughs> okay, than now, you're just, now you're just racking up the score, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <good. laughs> but, but what would you say to that person? Who's just, you know, they've been in maybe WFG for a while, a couple of years, whatever. They're not really getting anywhere. Their spouse is beating them up saying, look, we've been doing this forever. You're not making any money. It's not working. <clears throat> if, if you could say anything to that one person who's just waking up at 3 in the morning going, man, I'm probably going down the wrong road here. This is not for me. Yeah. What advice would you offer that person? Person. You know, I would say go on a 90 day mad person cycle, like go nuts for 90 days, put your head down. What I like to do anytime I'm out of town, I'll go back to the office and make 50 to 100 calls per day, three, four days in a row. And who do you call? And that stirs up the, uh, the activity. I'll call prospects, I'll call clients, I'll call recruits, old recruits, I'll call business cards. Right? Anybody and everybody. Older, even you know? people that quit? Yeah. You call them back. Yeah, call them up and say, <laughs> hey, I know back then timing wasn't right, but, you know, I just wanted to follow up with you. Oh, people you know? that didn't get in. Right. Do you ever call people that quit? I do. You do? Yeah. Of course you do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, momentum is magic. And if you can stir up that momentum and make 50 to 100 calls a couple days in a row, all of a sudden you'll be on a bunch of appointments and whoever goes on the most appointments wins in this business. So I would ask them. When's the last time you went on a 90 day mad person cycle where you just went nuts for 90 days? And the answer is probably they never have done it. You know, so if they, you know, a lot of people say things like, I'm quitting. I go, well, what do you mean you're quitting? You never started, <laughs> right? So if you never started something, you know, how are you going to quit? You know, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that might be some of the football coaching right there. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. Well, so. When you say go nuts, you say appointments. Is there anything else that they would do? What do they go nuts with besides the phone calls yeah, and the appointments? I mean, prospecting, collecting names and numbers, talking to people. Uh, what I used to do was five, five, fifty. Five prospects a day, five appointments a day, 50 calls a day. Okay. And I did that every day, seven days a week for about seven years straight. And I got to the very top of the company. So it's, it's activity, prospect, phone calls, and appointments, which will lead you to the results of the recruits and the points and the cash flow. What if they say, I've called all my friends and family. I don't know have anyone else to call. Who do they, who do they call? Well, you got to start prospecting people and, uh, and then collecting business cards from everywhere you go, and then you got to get good at getting referrals, right? Because we offer some incredible programs, and you know we don't charge anybody anything to do it. So I always say, hey, would you rather us charge you some money like some financial companies do, or would you rather just give us some referrals? So you have to expect referrals and get referrals and, and then call those referrals. And most of the appointments you're talking about, these appointments to sell people uh, a financial services product or to recruit them into the business? It's both, it's both. Okay. Yeah, usually how I do it, if, if we're at their home, on their home court, we're going to make them a client first if it's suitable. And then if they're at our home court, our office, we're going to recruit them first. 
You know, either way, we're going to do both. We're going to recruit them first and make them a client second, or make them a client first and recruit them second. We're going to do both, but only one at a time. Yep. If you had to do this all over again, you're starting out going way back 15, 15 years, right? About 15 years. Mm -hmm. What would you do differently? That's a good question. Uh, number one, I would have believed that it was possible for me sooner. A lot of people see all these success stories and they see all these people doing well and they say, well, wow, that's good for him or that's good for her. And they never see themselves doing it. So I would just from day one say, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And I would have believed it was possible for me sooner. That'd be number one. Number two, I would understand that yes, we are in a financial services company, but our focus is people. So you got to get good with people and you got to understand that we are a recruiting company. So you have to be recruiting and building and developing people. But the only way to develop people is you have to develop yourself first. So I'd really advice would be is hurry up and work on yourself and hurry up and become successful so then you can help other people become successful as well. Right. And, and know that, yes, we're in a financial company, but recruiting and building and developing people that's where the big money's at what do you love most about wfg that's uh exactly uh, what i just mentioned was the number one most profitable part of our business is when you recruit someone you train them you help them you coach them you mentor them you develop them and ultimately you're going to transform their life and not just in business but every aspect of their life is going to be transformed because of this business so i love that part i get messages all the time text messages and, and letters thank you for changing my entire life so I just, it's very, very a noble thing that we're doing to help people, but it, it actually pays us a lot to do it. We're getting 15 to 20% off every person that we're helping transform their life. So it's just a win-win situation. You're helping people tremendously, you're changing their entire life, and you're making tons of money to do it. So that's a win-win. Like sometimes I feel like I'm in a nonprofit organization because I'm helping people so much but then we just so happen to be in one of the highest paid industries in the world which is just a win-win situation so I love I love that aspect of it I really do just seeing people's lives change right before my eyes it's it's incredible paid nobility I guess huh? <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> I never associate Eric Olson with a nonprofit organization <laughs> that's right. that's but right. I see what you're saying yeah I see what you're saying yeah what do you say to people that are watching this? And sometimes, and I know you've heard this a million times. I've heard this. At, people have asked me this about you since we're friends. They've said, well, you know, Eric goes 90. He goes 90 miles an hour, man. I mean, he, he, he just he's not, doesn't have balance. I mean, I want to have a life. I want to do other things besides WFG. What do you say to those people? What, in terms of, and I don't mean in, in, in terms of a, a personal affront attack on you. I don't mean that because obviously it's a, it's a choice. But in terms of, do you have to be Eric Olson 90 miles an hour to be successful in this? You don't, you know, everybody kind of goes at their own pace, you know, but all I know is the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it, you know? So if you front load your efforts, then you're going to be successful a lot faster. You know, I think you could be temporarily unbalanced to then be, be more permanently balanced in the future. Like now I'm able to coach my little boys in sports and I love that. And uh, I'm able to go, you know, once a quarter on a little mini honeymoon with, with my wife and things like that, which is awesome. And I never did that before. So uh, I think if you can be temporarily unbalanced for a couple years to spend the rest of your life doing whatever you want, I mean, I think that's a good trade. Absolutely. But you don't have to be just like me. Everybody has to, you know, go at their own pace ultimately but all i know is the more you put into it up front the more you're going to get out of it at the end so you don't have to be a beast you don't you know <laughs> <laughs> i wrote that in the book yeah, I, I noticed said, i said the beast like behavior hey. of Erica, but i said it affectionately and i wrote it in there right, so you right. wouldn't get mad well no. beast the beast mode is always on just so you know it's not just a mode it's it's permanent so. <laughs> okay two more questions i know i know you gotta go yeah um is there a question that I didn't ask you about WFG or the opportunity or anything you want to talk about that, that you wish I would have asked you? You know, um, a good question that I think a lot of more people should ask is, what does it really, really, really take to be successful? Like, if, you, if I want to be where you're at, you know, what does it take? You know, and, uh, and that's, that's a good, a lot of people don't want to hear the answer. You know, a lot of people want the glory, but they're not willing to go through the story. You know, so, huh, yeah. um, you know, I think that's a that's a good question that all starting new associates should ask. 
what does it really, really, really take? And uh, I want you to know that the price is worth paying. It really is. Up front and in full. I mean, there's no success without sacrifice. But if you're willing to make temporary sacrifices, you'll have permanent gain. Okay, I have one other, one more question. Now that you said that, it just kind of spurred this. And I, I, this is something I know you probably would not talk about on stage because of obvious reasons. But this is something I'll bet a lot of people wonder about. Um, what's it like to be, and I know this is a, a, I don't mean this to be a self-aggrandizing kind of question on your behalf, but I, but I, I do want to ask you because I bet a lot of people would like to know this. What's it like to be, you just turned 36, right? Yeah. 36. So you're mm-hmm. a super young guy. Um, What's it like to be Eric Olson? You're making millions of dollars. You're having a big impact on a lot of people. You know, you're drumming up all kinds of energy with people and fire and fun and competition. What's it like to be Eric Olson? You know, I, I feel very blessed. I really do. And uh, because I've been blessed, I want to be a blessing to others. Uh, but it feels good. I wake up knowing that hard work pays off. I wake up knowing that all the sacrifice has been worth it. You know, I wake up knowing that if I can do it, then other people can do it as well. And I think it, you know, I believe God anointed me to do this business, and uh, I'm not going to take that for granted. You know, I want to go do something big. You know, I have uh, have some talents, I have some gifts, and I want to share them with the world and with my team and, and help a lot of other people become successful. So uh, it's awesome. It's incredible. I feel blessed. But I want a lot of other, I want to bring a lot of people down that road with me, and that will make me even more excited and more happy. Has the success made you happier? It, it has, you know. Um, I think, um, I think all the personal development and the mental toughness and the leadership, everything I've learned through this business has made me happier and you know I've been I've been sad and I've been happy and I've been rich and been been poor and being happy and rich is a little bit funner it absolutely, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, easier yeah, for sure it is, right yeah. It is. yeah it's a little little bit easier and because you know I I I can not be in this business and go start up something else and I'll be successful just because of what I've learned just because of what I've learned, the mental toughness, the leadership, the people skills, the dealing with people, you know, that's, and that's worth all the money in the world just right there. It's who you've become uh, as a reflection of being in this business. That's, that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. It sounds like what you're saying is it's more your happiness it, it is more around the personal development of what you become as opposed to just the money itself. Correct. Absolutely. You kind of get used to the money, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think a lot of people kind of wondered yeah. about that. And I, yeah. I did, and I know you probably right. did as well. Most people do and yeah. say, gee, I wonder what it's going to be like when I wake up, when I'm at my mountain, whatever mountain I decided right. to climb. Yeah. Being financially independent, being debt free is absolutely incredible, but I've been that for a long time now. Right. So it has to be more than just money. I think if you want to be at the pinnacle of success and you want to be the best, it has to be a lot more than money. And, uh, and for me and our team, it's about being number one. It's about being the best. It's about breaking records, it's about doing the right thing for, the, for clients out there and, uh, you know, being number one. So we won a couple Super Bowls and we want to win a lot more. You know, that's, that's <laughs> the goal. You know, so it has to be more than just money. Do you have the $5 million ring? Is that the ring? You know, uh, or no? The, I, I got the $5 million ring, but it's, but it's in the mail next week. Okay. okay. This, is, this is the $4 million. Oh, so, only the $4 so, million. Uh, oh, what so, about yeah. that little thing? What are we no, going to talk so, about so that? So I got ten, 10 of these rings now. <laughs> So I got to take that, that picture like that. You yeah, know? exactly. So, You're like a rap star. <laughs> <laughs> like Michael Jordan. That's Michael Jordan. There you go, yeah, Michael Jordan. Right, better. exactly. Okay, better. so my last question for you. I've never asked anyone this question, all the research, but you are the beast of WFG. I say it affectionately. You know I love you, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you have to say? This is kind of a fun question. You, I know you want to be you want to be the all-time biggest, and I put that in the book because you told it to yep. me, and I've known you for a yep. long time. We yep. talked about it before. Um, you want to be the biggest in the history of this business. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you have to say to your competitors? <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. You that's know, a good question. just winding them uh, up, man. <laughs> I, I just, I, I would just say. Uh, Happy competition, and uh, if they want to compete, they better bring their lunch, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and they can't get comfortable, because anybody that's ever tried to compete with me, they do it for a year or two, and then, then they let up the gas. So they got to know that if they want to compete, they better compete for 30 years straight. And if they're not willing to do it, then they're going to get left behind, absolutely. And the good news is my whole team's behind me, so it's not just me. i got a whole team of people in their 20s and 30s 
who are really good at this business as well. So competing is not for a month, not for a year. We're going 30 years all out. And if they're willing to do it, then game on, bring it on. But uh, they're going to need a lot of luck. They're going to need a lot. But uh, <laughs> hey, uh, bring it on. It makes me better. Every competitor has made me better. So, so I, I love it. I love the competition. But we, we got a great company. We got some great leaders in this company. I respect all of them. And uh, we're going to do something historic. And we're going to do something big in this organization. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. So. That's great. Well, Eric, I have a lot of respect for you. I appreciate yeah, you. coming, man. Appreciate it. Thank You're you, awesome. Steve. Thank you, man. You are too. Thanks. All right. And thank you for watching. Steve Siebel from the Bone Allen Mansion. We'll see you next time.